I've always kind of appreciated embroidery for having this kind of heirloom quality. I also mm -hmm. appreciate that it, it feels kind of connected to memory more than, than some other um, art forms. And um, it's so tactile, right? It's also like every stitch and even the fabric itself has just the traces of either fingerprints or just handwork. And um, so I don't know. Yeah, for me, kind of the size is about kind of this intimacy. And it's also just being able to complete work, right? If I, if I design work that's really large, um, it can take months as opposed to weeks. Um, right. And I, 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 at this point in my, in my life, I, I want to be able to produce more and kind of work through ideas. And um, so, so keeping things at this scale, that's like just enough that you can see what's going on, but not too much that it's excessive um, or will slow me down. Um, so I've kind of found this kind of sweet spot where everything is kind of between, you know, four inches and 10 inches and it's working. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely jealous of, of photographers or printmakers that can just like have an edition of 200 and you know, or painters that can just work on these massive scales. Um, but, you know, you kind of, you kind of do what, what you do. And um, well, it's important, it's important to identify what works for you as well. If going too large, and then the process becomes more frustrating, and the enjoyment level of it diminishes, and that affects the right. work, or, you know, it, you have to, yeah. you have to work long enough to figure out that formula of parameters that allows you to do yeah. what you yeah. feel comfortable with. Yeah, and to keep myself engaged too. I, I found when I was working on this piece that was a very large one that it was, um, by the end of it, I was just like ready to be done with it. And like, that's fine to feel like that with a piece, but um, it, I, it again, that scale that I found is a sweet spot. Like usually, usually by the time I'm done with a piece, I'm not like, like over it and I'm still engaged and I'm still excited about it and still finishing it. And um, yeah, it's after about three weeks, it gets a little trickier for me. It gets a little more like, um, becomes more like a task um, as, opposed right. to, um, as opposed to kind of a practice. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, 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 I can feel that way sometimes as well. And I've learned through experience that I have to be careful about scale and you know because I'm like you I I tend to want to complete things before I move on to the next thing and if the scale gets too large uh, that becomes more difficult but also I work with uh, paper from the streets and it's right. installed in patterns right so, uh, like um, you know this uh, particular piece up here was oh, actually wow. three, three times larger when it started Wow. But the patterns kept repeating and I mm. I actually started to feel a little trapped by the patterns and you know I just, wow. you have to release yourself from this. There was no requirement, you know, that this had like you have these ideas, you know, and right. you have the reality of it. And I was like, Insanity, is that worth it? Like do you really wanna do you really wanna put that into your work or do you wanna keep yeah. it joyful and you know, light or you know? Yeah. So I think it, I think it's a part of becoming a, a maturing as an artist is realizing that the art is actually telling you what it can do and what it's willing to do. The materials I find right. speak to me, and that's that goes back to that language thing. Totally, um, it's the same you know. as um, what's that? Um, I asked the brick what it wanted to be. Right. You're all, you are like, you're pulling out all the poetry and everything today. That's good. Uh, yeah, I know you're, it's true. I mean, I, th I do believe that. I think the materials do, they do speak to you in a way that they, and they communicate and some with materials, you. Yeah. And some materials work better at this scale than that scale. Some, you know, and shifting, it just means shifting, you know, it means more experimentation to figure out what works best. It's, it changes the language a little bit and, you know, um, you know, it's not as simple as just, you know, changing the font size, like it's, right. it's cause then once that, once it's bigger, then how does everything work now? It's everything changes. And like you were saying, like you noticed the, it became all about the pattern. Right. And so, because you didn't 
you know, maybe you, maybe that was, maybe that could have been exciting. And maybe you could have said, wow, I've never seen this before. I love this pattern. Now it's about this. Wow. But it's also just as, you know, it's also the same, the same choice to say, you know what, like, this is distracting from what I really want this piece to be about. And for me, this detracts. Um, And the happy scale for it is actually, if I take these off. Um, And then maybe what you take off can become something else. Um, No, it's, it's, it's a constant negotiation. And um, it's a constant kind of playing with this, playing with that, seeing how it works, seeing what works best. Um, Yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's all part of the, part of the fun, right? I mean, that's, it is. And it's, and it's, it's part of that language, but it's like you said, negotiation and negotiation is not one sided. It's a two sided thing. So right. you have to, you know, you have to have the willingness to hear what the materials or the process is telling you. And um, if you get, I find if I get to a point where I can't hear it anymore, the work, the quality of the work or the outcome of it starts to diminish. And um, right. so I think you, you intuitively start listening to that voice a little bit more and then there's a lot more happy yeah. accidents. There's a lot yeah. more celebrations totally. and like those moments where you're just like, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like it just, oh, it's, so, it's yeah. like a drug. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you notice something that maybe you did that you didn't even realize you did and then you're like, wow, that's amazing. Or, you know, when you, I, I love what you said about like negotiation means that it's, it's, it's more than just yourself, right? It's more than like you are engaging in dialogue with your own work. And that is a type of communication that you need to foster. And it's a type of communication that needs time and space, right? And so sometimes it's getting it to this place and then taking a step back and looking at it with fresh eyes and then allowing allowing yourself to, to have that discussion with your own work, which is so fascinating because it's, it's almost like having a conversation with yourself, but it isn't, right? Because, you know, you're like, there's that removal of you've already done this, you've already had these thoughts, you've already put something on the page. So then you're almost having, you know, a discussion with kind of your past self almost, right? Um, right. Or your, your, what you've created in your past time. Um, no, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I, I, I like that. Um, yeah, I think people. I think we tend, and especially like culturally, we we're so oriented towards the new, and we forget that there that inside of uh, the memories of history, like with, whether it could be like you know the yeah. trees that you're referring to that your mother had had done, um, yeah. those those memories, uh, that experience, and the emotional attachment to those things, still inform you know um, the pieces mm-hmm. that you're creating today, and sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes just uh, just the actions of doing those things are a way of keeping all the history together, you know. And yeah. so, so uh, I don't know. I find, I mean, I, I I find the process of creation is very much a meditation. So um, for me, like you had said, sometimes I go to the studio and I read, and sometimes I write, and sometimes I'll listen to music and you know, I put things on the wall and I'll stare at them for several weeks before I address one piece or, you know, but um, uh, it's not a, uh, it's not a production. Like I've had periods in my life where I've had a job and then I leave, you know, like when I was in Ohio, I would teach from seven until two. I would get on my motorcycle, go directly to my studio, and I would work from three until eight or nine o'clock at night. And that was my discipline. And the way that I approached the discipline was very task oriented. So I knew yeah. what I what I was working on and where I was going. Whereas now I can plant seeds um, and then, you know, tend to the garden and still right. have like one main thread going. And right. then there's another one like there, there's no shortage of, of work to right. do um it's just a matter of you know when is the right time to approach it and i think that's a luxury of a of a studio artist uh, full-time practice um you know so during the quarantine we get the opportunity to like explore that concept if that's not a part of our you know regular life um so yeah I, I think it's interesting what people are producing right now because you know that a larger percentage yeah. of people don't 
get the opportunity to do that in a constant way. So yeah. there's totally. a lot of creativity coming out of a pandemic, you know? Um, there is, there is. And, you know, I've, I have friends who have been productive. I have friends who haven't made a single thing, you know, and I think all of it is valid and, um, yeah, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a crazy time. So it'll be, you know, I don't think we'll see the repercussions um, immediately. And I also think just we won't realize what happened in art communities and art worlds immediately either. Um, I think um, it's we'll gonna be, to, it's, we'll it'll, be five, it'll be five, you know, 10 years down the road when we look back and you'll actually be able to see what actually occurred. I really don't think that even with all the art that's being created, that's telling the story of it, I don't know that we're going to have an understanding of what's really happened for quite a while. I think. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I was watching some interview. I've been watching a lot of like little interviews, and people have been going live on Facebook, all that stuff. And this one woman kept saying, "Post COVID, like, oh, this work is post COVID." And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what? what? <laughs> Shut post COVID? Like, no. <laughs> like, first of all, we're like. I guess they meant like post the start of COVID, right? Not post like post, not like after like a, COVID, but like like a sign post, post. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> like post. You're halfway there. <laughs> well, I mean, we all love to in the art world love to like you know. Oh, is it? Oh, are we are we post post modernism? Are we you know? Is, or you know? I've always the last few years I've 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 toyed with the phrase post queer and like what's post queer and is that a thing and um yeah so well that brings um, a lot of things to mind i mean uh, for me and this you know my my focus with the residency and everything that i'm doing is uh really about supporting the queer community and then people are like well i've had people like say to me i don't know if you can interview me i don't think i'm queer enough and i'm like that's that's ridiculous i mean there are queer is like a spectrum of things it's not right. It's not one thing or another. You don't need to be a flamboyant drag queen or, you know, it's exactly, uh, you know, there's a diversity inside of queer. And to yeah. me, what queer is referring to is the sort of outsiderness and the ability to mm -hmm. make the reality of that and, you know, up it a little bit, like take reality and make it more brilliant, make it more meaningful, mm -hmm. make it more timely. Um, and queer is about his, its history. It's building on the experiences of other people. So, wow. um, so there are I consider you know I, there's artists who who identify as straight and blah blah blah, but they have a queer sensibility to the way they work, right. and they're not and they're not working against a, a queer agenda either. They're not working against the right. LGBT community. They're not you know they're not um, uh, trying to bring us down or, you know, marginalize right. the work or anything. They're just a part of the community. It's a natural, and that's where we should be. I mean, I, in my opinion is we shouldn't oh, be, we shouldn't, absolutely. we shouldn't have to label ourselves or anything, but you know, for me, right. queer is political too. It's like, if, yes. you're, if Trump is going to be president, then I'm going to say that I'm queer because, you know, right. I, if you take my voice away from me, I want you to, I want other people who admired the work that I did or the person I was or whatever it is, they need to understand that the reason my voice was taken away from me was because I'm queer and I didn't fit right. into what somebody else wanted from me. So right. I, um, it, I'm curious where it's... queer comes into your consciousness and how you perceive that as a... Wow. Well, I, I love what you say about kind of queer as transformative, right? And this idea of a big part of it is like taking something and totally changing it or shifting it or or beautifying or um or destroying or um because there is yeah i think that idea of kind of like this outside perspective and then creating change or transfiguring through that unique position right um there's something really beautiful about that um queer I, you know like i came up when you know, like coming out as a gay man, that was the term, right? And gay man and lesbian, trans, like it was much more kind of divided labels, right? And, you know, as queer kind of became more and more the umbrella term, it just, for me, it was just, it became much more 
that kind of unifying, right, which I always strived for. Um, you know, Atlanta and living in Atlanta as a young kid um, and going out, like, the most exciting kind of events or groups or communities were um, not the ones that were so strictly kind of defined. They were much more, you know, you get a little bit of everything, right? And it's, you know, safe space for kind of queer individuals, but straight people who are allies were intermixed. And um, so, yeah, I kind of uh, aligned and, ad and adopted queer as more, I, I don't really describe myself as a gay man as much anymore, although it certainly is true. Um, and I think it is that kind of looking for for unity, right? And, you know, trying to support each other and um, especially, you know, people have very different backgrounds, histories, lives. Um, um, and it's it's nice to have that that kind of sense of communi community and connection through people that um, are outliers, especially, and I think what you're saying right now, like especially at a time like this under a president like this in the States, um, I think that that unity is really important. Um, and that, that labeling as being um, anti that or the opposite of that, I think is really important. Um, uh, well, it, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of a retro concept. I mean, it's the identity politics of the '90s, right? To, to label yourself, but right, isn't that isn't that uh, labeling? Isn't that what the other side is doing? And they're using those. You know, it's the history of using labels to transform right. them into something else. Uh, right. as well I, I I kind of I you know I agree with you I don't really like I never I don't really refer to myself as a gay man I don't because I don't because to me that feels very uh, like a limitation and it also is very retro um, right right because the, the gay community that I grew up in wasn't diverse it was you know I mean it was white men it was you know right. um, even in the time that I was in ACT UP a majority of the people in ACT UP were were white men and we all right. had privileges related to those things and you yeah. know and historically you know uh now of course you look back and you the, you see those things clearly I, I don't think at the time that i i had enough life experience to um understand mm -hmm. that's what was happening i you know i was in a bubble of course but mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean it's a it, to you know and it's not just the united states it's you know russia and like all these places yeah. where people are murdered and yeah. you know it's my neighbor yeah. who is upset that i have a queer community center and targets me and you know and it always escalates after an event you know um wow so, but those but you don't have to you know it's not 1990 anymore you don't have to scream faggot and throw a bottle from a car um you understand when aggression is coming at you because of who you are whether it's because you're a woman um, you know, a black man and, you know, bird watching and Central Park or, I mean, you, yeah. people don't, people don't have to specifically call you something for you to understand the energy that's coming towards you and what the meaning of that is for the person. And right. that to me is why it's important to stand for something and to, you know, yeah. say, no, I, I refuse to be uncomfortable um, in this world because you're not comfortable because really right. the, the reality of it is the majority of the world, I believe, um, you know, I, I think they see the humanity um, in, in, uh, yeah. in uh, one another and whether or not they agree with like your lifestyle or, you know, or if that's right for them, I think there are a lot more people on the side of live and let live. And I'm not, I'm not going to judge this. I, you know, yeah. Look at look at where we are in the world right now with the pandemic and the inequalities that it's so clearly exposed. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. Be increasingly more difficult for people to draw those lines and say, "Oh no, that doesn't exist." Yeah. Um, I hope. <laughs> I really hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it, I think you know I often try to think of like, what's the role of the artist right now? What's the role of the artist in society and culture and I mean, for me, artists have always been, um, they have like a unique ability of documentation. And mm -hmm. the 
it's specifically emotional documentation of the times, right? So of course, you know, photographers, painters, right? Like, you know, certainly have just kind of documentation just naturally comes to comes to mind. But there's something about um, kind of processing and documentation of emotions at a time like this in, in a culture in, that just it's it's a it's a unique and important position that you know immediate you know isn't immediately um um you know we don't immediately realize its importance but um it it just kind of looking back on times before us and when you look at the artwork from that time i for me that's the most telling right like when you look at kind of points in history looking at the artwork that was created at the time what was painted who was painted how were they painted um it, what were the historical context yeah the historical context of that too like why would they exactly. create something like that so like I, I whenever i've created kind of portraiture or kind of documentation of queer culture through that that feels super important um especially you know i mean you certainly see that so much with um black artists in america right now creating work that is all about kind of black figures being in museums being in positions and in poses that before hadn't you know been able to um right and almost like a royal, like a royalty of uh of images you know this this sort of gold um standard of images yeah, so see, like th that is super inspiring. I mean, times that I've been able to document um, kind of drag queens and in, in projects that I did in Atlanta, documenting drag culture. I mean, certainly drag queens are documented and celebrated. So I'm not saying that that is not the case, but but th there is a unique. There's also something to be said for um, alternative documentation, and um, you know maybe you know back when there were drag shows at clubs but maybe in a night there'd be you know hundreds of videos and phone uh and and pictures of a queen's performance but you know those maybe those photos will just never get seen or used or squirreled away or anything um but there's also something like yeah alternative documentation where it's like what would a portrait look like made out of you know ceramic what would what would, what would it look like made out of threads what would it you know and you get kind of a different take you get um something that's not obsessed with like just trying to document you know this is exactly what they look like and instead you you pick up on little details or symbolism or color choices or um you just i don't know i i, I like that you get a little more of that um and i i try to approach that when I'm when I'm working with the, a figure or portraiture, just because um, there's opportunities to to mess with it and play with it and um, kind of pull pieces out or highlight things that um, uh, wouldn't be possible with you know photography or painting, right? Like, what is unique about working in threads what what are the what are like what are your superpowers right and like how <laughs> can you and, and yeah and like how can you use those powers for good right oh gosh hey, I yeah i just went there <laughs> well no no i mean i i mean that i there was an interview i did a, a few years ago and the question came up about uh, why do you call yourself a queer artist and everything and i actually said being queer is like a superpower it's a you know it's a word but it's like putting on a cape and the cape yeah. elevates you and it makes you something more and it's a way of defending yourself against the outside things but it's also a way of clearing a path you know for the for people behind you and so many people yeah. have been superheroes like you know right. obviously this, this week like larry kramer passed yes away. yes you know, oh my god um, yes seriously and and so to me he is like a queer superhero you know i, yeah. I he he was considered toxic and a abrasive and you know and uh h h what he said was difficult to hear and um that he right. produced some of the most beautiful art art uh literature plays uh he yeah. um he was true to himself whether that was hard for other people or not he managed to be himself in a world that was not an easy place uh is, is not an easy place to to be yourself and to me that's like those are the heroes. Those are that's the cape yep. that queer gives you, and I think that's why people 
have attached to like uh you know like the whole RuPaul world mm -hmm. <laughs> um which is yeah. constantly expanding but it's also it's giving a context for people to find themselves you know and so that's why yeah. I don't like que queer used to be a very closed community isolated and everything right. and I, I prefer a more modern a more contemporary way of viewing it and saying no the queer community is quite large and and there's yeah. an element of that queer community for everybody um, if they're willing to accept that part of themselves too so very mm -hmm. very interesting uh, I, I, I've, I so enjoyed talking to you I mean you're your work is engaging. Um, your, Me your, too. Uh, this is uh, amazing. Your, I needed this. Yeah. No, I did too. I you really this helped has me. This been a, lot. a rough week. This has been a rough week, and I have I have multiple. Fr I have three friends that are going through horrible breakups right now. So Ugh. it's also like trying to support them while also just being devastated by what's going on everywhere. Oh, it's just. And you're supporting people at a distance. You know, you can't you can't be in the room with them, or you can't you know. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a difficult time. I mean, it's it's a, uh, I think you know it's going to change our perspective on what it means to be in the same room with someone and how we, how we appreciate yeah. those sort of things too. Yeah. Not, not to diminish that. what the connection that we were able to make uh, in Zoom, which is always surprising to me. Uh, I never would have yeah. thought oh that possible. <laughs> you know, I've always done my interviews face to face, you know, so, um, so this is a, well, hopefully you know. we can still do that someday, you know? Yeah. Like, well, hopefully. I'm excited that you're going to participate in the Existimo show. Oh, um, I'm thrilled. I'm so thrilled. I've, you know, I've since, you know, certain, like since moving to the West coast, of course, but beforehand, I mean, you just, you hear about the art world in Mexico city and people talk about it. And I mean, it's just, it sounds so vibrant and interesting and creative and, in my mind, it just, it's, you know, I just imagine how different and fantastic it is. I'm sure there's some more similarities than I imagine, but anytime well, you've never been somewhere, you imagine like, I oh, mean, I think, wow. I think there are similarities to Los Angeles. The way I think about sure. Mexico City is more like it's New York City in the 80s, you know, um, pre-gentrification, mm -hmm. you know, there right. were elements of glamour in New York City at that time. There was a separation right. of classes. But there was like an affordability that allowed yep. artists to exist in the same space. Um, and here there's definitely like an energy. And there's a lot of different ways that it's expressed. It's street art, it's museums, it's galleries. I mean, oh. there's multiple tiers yeah. at different, doing different things. Architecture. Yeah. Um, Music, dance, know. yeah. Los Angeles is uh, a city of the new. It always has been. It's always yeah. a future moving city. So architecture. Yeah. It's taken away and new things are built right reinvented Here, yeah i mean you know there's and there's elements of of an aztec culture two blocks from here you know um wow next to an office building that was built in the 70s or 80s and then there's right. like something from you know colonial and you know and so right i think there's a richness of texture and things that can be very inspiring and you know at times a little overwhelming and um, sure. you know it's 20 five plus million people um so in a yeah. space that really is not that large um so <laughs> in the cauldron of a volcano <laughs> like the history of that right alone i mean it, yeah this used to all this used to be a lake <laughs> so you Wild. know you get a rain you get a rainstorm and all the water rises up out of the ground and you're standing ankle deep in water you know or whatever substitutes as a yeah. liquid uh, you know so it's you know there are all these contradictions and i think inside of the contradictions is where art thrives so um yeah. so it's it's possible uh i you know i know an italian artist in los angeles who left italy because italy's culture of art was so restrained and he feels very mm. free in los angeles to do what he wants to do sure and i i in some ways you know, felt some limitations within Los Angeles. And then when I came here, I was like, you know, it's yeah. kind of, but it, you know, it's all these like little yeah. mental locks inside of our heads and it takes different you're, triggers. You're to totally open right. Up. You're totally right. I mean, definitely. I mean, for as, for, for me, right. Cause again, like you're saying, like for different people, it, it's different things, right. For me, continuing to make artwork in Atlanta, I think I would have still had I don't think I would have given myself the permission to expand like I did. And that probably 
was was all in my head. And some, you know, I do think it's important for artists to move around. I think it can be really helpful um, to get a different perspective, if, like work with different communities, be inspired by different places. Um, you know, if possible, it's 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 so important. Um, but yeah, no, there's also just yeah, coming to coming to LA. Also, I think just I think it lit a fire under my ass too, just because seeing how how tough it is to get your work on a wall of a gallery in this city. Right. There are so many artists, and even though there are so many galleries and um, places, there's just yeah, no, it definitely. Um, forced me to just kind of step it up and um and just I think also for me living in Atlanta um you know maybe like so many of my friends who were in the arts didn't actually produce much artwork right that it was often all about the party and you know that's certainly the case in LA too but I mean I met on the first year of moving here, I met many artists who just rock my world and make work that is so mind blowing. And they are, you know, have devoted time in studio and are all about their practice while juggling a teaching position or this or that. And I mean, that is so inspiring for me too. Cause I've, 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 I've always been this kind of, I always have a bit of a mirror personality where like, when I'm around other people doing things, I'll pick up on like phrases or I'll pick up on kind of things, euphemisms or body language. And it's the same, like if I'm around other artists who are making stuff that's really inspiring, stuff that's huge, that's like, they're just producing like, you know, I, I'm not gonna make what they're making, but it just forces me to be like, get to it. Like, right. you gotta be real, like, this is how you do it. Like. And I was I was doing that for years in Atlanta, but it's tougher when all that energy and willpower has to come from you. It's there's something, you know, that you can really, especially in a big art city like New York or you know London or LA or Mexico City, right? Like you just feed off of that. And whether it's like going to an opening, uh, you know, mm -hmm. like right around the corner from me is a lot of the Hollywood galleries, and like. The last opening I went to before the isolation was a Catherine Opie opening. And I mean, talk about like queer history, right? I mean, again, this like she knocked down the door for so many people and has become a respected voice and queer icon, right? And, you know, the privilege of being able to drive, you know, 10 minutes and go to see this opening and like see her in the crowd and like see this work um and then you know i come home and i go right to studio because i'm so inspired and it's just right. like i love a show like that i love like that's what that's what is so great about being in a big city like this and of course like you know i haven't been to a show since and for me <laughs> vir like virtual tours are they're a little tough for me i mean i've been i've been inspired by what i see on instagram i've been inspired by seeing other people working and posting and like that for me is is has been enough um but but yeah no i i, I there's something about being surrounded by an incredible art scene and people really pushing and creating work and um, having their language that they've been creating for years. And um, I mean, that show, half of the work was like beautiful, giant, large format uh, photos of swamps, like printed huge. And there'd be cute little details of like an owl would be hidden in it or like an alligator or just like rain was just starting to fall and just like gorgeous swamps. And after living in the South, like, I mean, I love a good swamp. They're gorgeous. And then, the, <laughs> then the, the inside was all these, um, like she'd kind of created this like kind of fake graph and then was doing these kind of cut out stop motion animation. And they were very political and they were like on these kind of oversized iPads almost that were like in a circle in the middle. And so much of it was political and about the Trump administration and the swamp compared to the other swamp. And like, certainly, you know, she was trying to hit us over the head with a lot of stuff. And I didn't love the, like, I loved the swamp stuff. I thought they were gorgeous. I didn't love the cutout animation as much, but I loved that as an artist, she had that space to experiment with stop motion animation and to create this political work. And that, you know, she was able to create this work that 
I didn't really even like that much, but I liked that she made it. And I liked that, you know, it wasn't just the swamp photographs, which are expected, gorgeous, like, you know, um, amazing photography. And she is a photographer. So, you know what I mean? Like, for, for me, like, if the show had just been those, um, you know, I would have thought it was fine. But, you know, there's something about yeah, I just, I, I loved that show. I really did. Um, and I also loved that my partner hated it. Like, he was like, can we leave? <laughs> he was like, he was like, I don't really like any of it. And it's like, 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 I, 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 I don't know. I just, I love being a part of kind of this culture. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely brings up the subjective side of, of things in terms of how people respond to it and something that yeah. you respond to, you know, yeah. someone you're very close to doesn't respond the same way. But it's like, wow, isn't it great that there's enough diversity in the world that we can all find something that we like, that it doesn't have to look like one thing. It doesn't have yes. to be one thing anymore, you know? Of course. Like, that's my biggest fear of this whole pandemia thing is that there's some sort of like unification or tyranny that comes out of it that, you know, creates like this unified look. And I think it's the artists yes. who are going to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, artists yes. and activists, you know? Totally. Um, yeah. So, I mean, uh, look at Germany and world war ii all those museums and like all that crap that was made and like the most boring art ever like, <laughs> like yeah but at the same time like you look at like kathy kolowitz her printmaking and she was literally like scraping rust off of her jail cell so yeah. and then taking as she would take the the fur coats off of the um german officers uh wives and girlfriends she would take hairs from the coat and she would make brushes mm -hmm and then use the rust to do her paintings. Oh. And, and you just like, and then the subject matter, you know, beyond that, and you're just like, there's such yeah. a need for human creativity that in yeah. those conditions you can produce, you know? Yeah. So- uh, Talk about queer transformation, right? Like right. that is 100% transformation and like superpowers, right? Right, I mean, exactly. It, and, it, and it does, it feels that way and it's healing for the person making it because even if you're just getting an inch each day, like it's an inch further than you did yesterday. And right. I think people need those tiny milestones right now. Yeah, especially when time is has a really yes. messed up. Like I just, I yeah. never remember what day it is. I don't know, you know, sometimes I think it's noon and I look outside and it's eight o'clock at night or, you know, like, yeah. and I wake up at two in the morning and I think it's 12 in the afternoon and, you know, uh, yeah. because everything everything is stopped. There's no there's no punctuating moments and things, and so there's like this uh, unknown about what's happening. You know, yeah. Um, and I think yeah. then that just this that discomfort is a cauldron for art. Um, you know, it's um, it's a it's a call. <laughs> Um, yeah. you know, to every artist out there to, you know, interpret these things and to make right. meaning out of these experiences. So yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad that you're able to work. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. I'm, I mean, I'm very, and I'm, I'm aware that, you know, so many artists, um, you know, can't get access to their studio or they work, you know, they don't have a kiln at home or they don't, they can't weld at home or, or just like their studio was set up downtown in LA and now they have to move out and now they you know I, I mean people are or you know people who are in school that are then locked out of their school and are like mm -hmm. you know I'm a sculpt like I'm a sculptor major how the fuck am I supposed to do that but I don't know right. I hear I hear like like friends their kid he's at Bard right now and like got really into sculpture and was doing all this welding and he came home right because they sent everyone home and he has been using his grandmother's um, sewing machine and the grandmother's past, but um, this sewing machine is one of these old ones that's like really metal and it's built into it. And it's like, sounds like a very butch, like a very butch one. And so the fact that- Well, it's a like, machine. It's a right. machine. There's no glamor, yeah, there's exactly. no softness, you know? Right. And so this, you know, this straight guy who's like getting into welding is now being like, has found that this sewing machine of his grandmother is, is so like hearing stories like that are like really heartening and like I mean at the end of the day like you know if if the work like if over the last three months not one artist made one thing like the world would still turn right like no one would have no one would have died from that like but you know like it is it is powerful 
to see that how resilient humans are and that through all of this, um, we still want to process it. We still want to express ourselves. We still like, there's, there still is that need and there's some hope in that because if we still feel that need, even in the darkest of times, even in times where we're like, who knows, like, who knows if there is a future, right? And like to still spend time, precious time that we have um, with an even more unknown future to create an object, to create an idea, to create something um, with the hope to heal or express ourselves or document or whatever, like that's just hope, right? It really is like, you know, if there's an indication of hope, it's really that. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure many people would say like, oh my God, like, you know, how can you say that like an artist making something is hope compared to like essential workers, healing people in a hospital like of course very different very different very different yeah very but different. why does there why is there one definition of hope i mean it's right. it's that same ideal of diversity that there's enough different kinds of artwork out there to touch everyone in some specific way you know there's something yeah. out there for you well there's yeah. there's different kinds of hope and we need i think you, we just need all of them you know we can't yeah we can't be I, choosy. I do too. you're totally right because you know there there may be a doctor who like despises the clapping at seven o'clock and find that, you know, patronizing and stupid, but maybe they're, you know, they've found new life from the new Lady Gaga album. You know what I mean? And like <laughs> that, that is still under the umbrella of art and that's still under the umbrella of queer and, you know, whatever, like whatever, whatever brings people hope and gets people through the day, I'm, I'm all here for, so. Um, yeah. 